Good morning, everyone. Or this, when you're watching this, this probably could be afternoon. This is our weekly forum. We have Brandt, we have all the directors, and the thing missing during this coronavirus issue is you. But we thank you for your support, and we thank you for everything that you're doing to make our community effort, community effort a success. I have with me this morning Mr. Harry Coble. It's an employee gift fund time, and I'm going to give Harry some time before I make some more remarks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Harry Coble, chairperson of the employee gift fund. Uh, thank you, Don, for that kind of introduction. Uh, a lot of people ask me, what is the purpose of the employee gift fund? The purpose of the employee gift fund is to allow individuals to donate donations either monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually so that we can give them to our hard-working employees in December. I want to take a moment to talk of those 50% who do not give. I don't know what your reason is, but please, you need to consider giving because our goal could be twice as big if all of you gave. So let me encourage you to give. The suggested donation is 250 for a single person, uh, 350 for a couple. We have six uh, boxes, EGF boxes. We have two in the tavern, two in the north, two in the south. And also we actually have eight, if you count the two that we also have in Sylvan. So we have a, a lot of boxes around. Uh, we just have a, a wonderful time. Uh, in December, we plan on our appreciation party the first Sunday in December. And I talked to Mr. Spence. He thinks that's going to be a go. So we will be planning that and, and have all the activities. And let me encourage you as residents, come out. It's your money and thank those hard-working employees. Let me encourage the supervisors to come out because we invite the grandparents, the parents, and the children. So it should be a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, and I have a thought of the day. Love each other, pray for each other, encourage each other. If you're not active, become active. Have a wonderful weekend. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Infante. Okay. I have a favor to ask of you guys and Gales. Do you remember Brant put out a liability letter and uh, he asked for us to sign it and get it back to the front desk? Well, we only have about 25% of our residents who have done that. I understand you may have some concerns, but Brant and the team are pushing it hard to get us open. And LCS is using this survey or this liability letter as an indicator of what kind of unity we have in our community. And 25% gang is not, is not exactly unity. So I would ask you if you haven't signed your liability letter and got it back to the front desk, to please do so. This is about community unity. We're trying to open up, and this is a key indicator to LCS of what kind of unity we have in our community. So please do it, and do it so. I'm gonna turn it over to Brad. Well, good morning, everybody. Don, Harry, thank you uh, so much for those remarks. We're going to dig directly into our COVID numbers and this morning we're going to start at sort of a global perspective and drill down into uh, the state and the local. So let's go directly to the boards. So this is the uh, cumulative case data from uh, John Hopkins. As you can see the United States is uh, pretty much covered in red. Uh, we do lead the world in uh, terms of uh, cumulative cases. We are now over 5 million cases. We're followed uh, by Brazil with uh, 3 million 224. Uh, you can see that China, uh, all the way over there in, in Asia, 
uh, they look pretty clean. This is potentially where uh, the coronavirus uh, originated and uh, uh, they have been able to get past the curve and they are uh, pretty clearly in recovery uh, while the rest of, of Europe and the United States and uh, particularly South America are uh, still experiencing daily increases. We're going to go over to the active cases and these are uh, great graphs because they just give us a visual representation of uh, what's happening. These are new active reported cases. It does not include uh, those people who have been confirmed as positive uh, and have either recovered or passed on. Uh, you can see that the United States, uh, as opposed to the previous slide where the entire country was covered in red, uh, we do appear to be uh, uh, shrinking the number of active cases and uh, the United States is beginning to clear. Again, look over at uh, China. They have almost no active cases. That's a really encouraging sign that uh, uh, we're a couple of months behind, but we have the potential to get to that stage as well. We're going to flip over to the uh, facility, I'm sorry, fatality rate. Uh, and here's something that I think is, is really uh, a powerful uh, tool for us. Yes, we've had a, a large number of deaths here in the United States, uh, but look where they have come from. It's uh, that northeastern seaboard. It's primarily uh, New York City. Uh, more than 45% of all fatalities here in the United States have occurred uh, in that region. Uh, and more importantly, take a look down there at Florida. I know it's small, uh, but the number of fatalities uh, uh, here in Florida is relatively mild compared to uh, what we're seeing in some of the other hot spots uh, across North America. One interesting thing for me is look at uh, uh, look at Mexico and what is happening uh, right down uh, in, in, in uh, Mexico right now. This would not be a good time to vacation in, uh, in Mexico. Let's go over to the testing rates. Uh, pretty much what you might expect. Uh, there are a limited number of test kits available and the government response is to test in the areas where uh, there is a, an outbreak. Uh, you can see that the testing here in the uh, Tampa Bay up to Orlando uh, area is, is pretty intense. Uh, New York City and the northeastern coast is uh, getting the majority of the test but we are continuing to see increased number of tests on a daily basis. And then that relates to the last chart, which is the hospitalization rate. And this is a key for Florida. This is the uh, ability to overwhelm the healthcare system. And you can see that really there's only a, uh, been a couple of places in the, in the country where we have completely uh, overtaken the demand uh, and not been able to provide the uh, beds that we needed. Here in Florida, uh, the Tampa Bay area has uh, a large, uh, pretty large dot, dot uh, but uh, our capacity here in Pinellas County is, is solid. So we're still in the uh, John Hopkins database and uh, uh, what I wanted to show you here was the uh, testing overview. Uh, the number of daily new cases. This is the uh, chart on the bottom left. Uh, you can see that last week the trend was downward. This week it's uh, uh, stable and we're getting a pretty much straight line. The number of daily testing, it's 1.8 tests per thousand people. Uh, so last week we were down, this week we've had a little improvement. And then the daily positive seven day average uh, for new cases, we're sitting at 17.7%. And you know that uh, we're shooting to get under 10%. So we still have uh, a ways to go here. 
So I wanted to uh, end the uh, slide portion of our presentation by uh, sharing something that's just really good news and it uh, uh, gives us a great graphic of, of just how well we actually are doing. I know if uh, you listen to these numbers every day and they're going up and, and it's easy to lose perspective, but this, uh, this chart brings us back to, to what we really need to focus in on. This is the uh, number of new cases you can Go all the way back to June 1st, you see that we had gone through 60 days of stable, uh, a period of st stability. June 1st, we started to uh, reopen as we entered phase one. It immediately jumped up on July 1st. We entered phase two. It absolutely shot through the roof. Uh, or by July 16th, we had hit a peak of uh, 14,000 new cases a day. Uh, and then look what has happened since then. Uh, so over the, the last uh, 20 some odd days, we've just seen a complete drop off of the number of new cases. And there was a statistic that was published yesterday that in 44 states across the country, the numbers are either stable or declining. So a significant turnaround over where we were just uh, 20 short days ago. All right, let's take a look at the numbers here for the uh, state in Pinellas County. We're up to 557,000 cases here in Florida. That's up about 7,000 uh, over the last 24 hours. We've had 8,900 fatalities. The really encouraging news is it's uh, only up about 180 uh, over the last 24 hour period. So that's a, a significant decline in the numbers. Pinellas County is uh, really stabilizing quickly. We're at 18,201. It's up just about 100 new cases overnight and our uh, fatalities are at 536. Uh, they're only up 14 uh, over the 24 hour period. Um, so numbers are looking good. Our testing is increasing. We are at uh, 176,000 tests uh, and that's a 10.36% testing ratio. Uh, so a good number there. And then of course our hospitalizations continue to look really good. Uh, 1,785 people hospitalized in Pinellas County uh, because of COVID uh, and only 339 in our specific zip. So that looks great. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Leslie to share what's happening here at Regency Oaks. Good morning, Regency Oaks, and happy Friday. For our numbers here in quarantine on our independent living residents, we have 14. They are all non-COVID related hospital stays or an overnight vacation. We have zero in assisted living and 10 in our skilled nursing under quarantine. For our staff members, we have zero in independent living and zero in assisted living, but one in skilled nursing at this time. For current COVID testing, we have zero residents in independent living, skilled nursing, and uh, assisted living. Our only employees that are currently being tested are the assisted living and the skilled nursing for their bi-weekly testing. No other symptomatic testing is occurring. This is great news so far. We've had 10 days in a row of no symptomatic testing for residents or employees. So let's keep that track record going. Also, for our COVID confirmed cases, we have our three residents uh, from the past as well as our 15 employees. So overall, we've had our residents, again, our three that were positive, but negative is 198, as well as associates, it's 15 positives, and negative is 527. We know that we are doing a great job because last year during our flu shot clinics that we had with our resident staff members, we had such a high participation that it kept all of us healthy and our immune systems up. So this year we will have our flu shot clinics hosted again by CVS Pharmacy. We have three dates so far. We have September 30th, October 1st, and October 7th. On your medical appointments book tables, you will see these flyers out 
that state the time and location which is the wellness center down the norfolk hallway one zero six you will sign up at these tables on these sign up sheets you'll see for all three dates make sure you sign up for this as well as pick up a consent form fill it out properly and have it turned into the front desk by monday september 21st so cvs can make sure they have all your medical insurance information to process the flu shot claim if you have any questions, please give me a call at extension 501. Thank you. All right, so that uh, concludes our COVID information for today. We're gonna roll over to our department reports and first up is Sherry. Good afternoon and happy Friday. Just wanted to touch base on what we're doing in the finance department. Um, we're beginning our budgeting season for 2021. And with that comes where we are going to be budgeting for our monthly service fee increases. Now, please note that last year we did our presentation and discussed what the 2020 budgeting increase was for. So throughout the year, as we have our increases, you are getting a 60 day notice letter and that presentation that we did for you last year in 2019 pertained to the 2020 budget. This year, we're going to do that again. However, we're not going to do our first presentation meeting until October. First letters will go out November for January 1st. And the reason why we're doing this in October is we're just now beginning the budget season. I will not have that percentage increase in information available until we close the budget at the end of September. So look for, um, hopefully by, by then we can meet live. If not, we will have other methods to communicate that to you all uh, for the 2021 budget. If for any reason uh, you have questions uh, in regards to the letters you've received this year for your September 1st increase, or if your neighbor has questions, please have them call me. I'm happy to meet with folks so maybe in a small group. We can revisit last year's presentation and answer questions in small groups or certainly one-on-one. -on -one. I wanna make sure that you feel like you are informed and I um, will make sure that that happens. So please call me at extension 337 and I look forward to presenting to you in October for our 2021 budgeted monthly service fee presentation at that time. Thanks and have a great weekend. Hello, I'm Perry Goodbar, new in sales and marketing. I'm delighted to be here and I've got a, a brief update on what we've been up to in the sales and marketing department. Uh, this week we've had a, a guest day from Nancy and Rich Fremkin from up in the uh, Gulf Breeze, Florida near the uh, Pensacola area here getting things all tidied up and ready for their move in to be some of your new neighbors. Uh, we're also very excited this week. We had a closing with a delightful couple from Palm Harbor, Carol and, and Jake Reisinger. Uh, for all the Ohio State fans, he's a big Penn State fan, so we may have to keep everyone separated. We'll have to see, but, but they're a delightful couple. They'll be moving in uh, later on in September. Uh, we are, are getting active again with our marketing uh, events. We have two upcoming, one next Thursday, uh, Dine and Discover. We have about 10 guests that we'll be entertaining uh, for that. And then the following week, we'll have a virtual uh, resident panel. And uh, we have about three ambassadors right now. We'll, we had a marketing meeting uh, two weeks ago, and so we have that upcoming and have talked about uh, what we're gonna be uh, discussing. And then also uh, with Judy uh, Sudebaker and the marketing group, uh, we'll be uh, reassembling the ambassador meeting and that'll be coming up on August 27th. And those that are involved will certainly be uh, notified of that. But I'm delighted to be here. I'm really enjoying uh, meeting everyone and look forward to meeting all those that I have. Have a great day and a wonderful weekend. Good morning, I'm Rance Macy. I'm the healthcare administrator at the health center next door. A um, few things this morning, um, we started our uh, every other week testing again for staff this week. Um, that started um, Wednesday and it finished up uh, yesterday afternoon. We should have those results back Monday or Tuesday. Um, to date, we've had 10 total COVID-19 cases in the health center. Um, we also received our rapid test machine from CMS. Um, 
It's, uh, it's a nice little machine. It's about 85% accuracy rate. Um, it's good for 3,500 tests. So uh, that's something that we'll be able to use in case any um, staff or um, resident gets symptomatic. We can test them right away to see if they have it or not. And finally, um, I want to announce uh, a new administrator to, to replace me has been hired. His name's Gerard DeHill. Um, he has 25 years experience uh, in this industry working as a healthcare administrator. He's done both ALF and uh, skilled nursing. And um, I think you guys are gonna like him. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. All right, thank you uh, department managers for your updates. Uh, we're gonna spend the balance of our time this morning with our dining services team and talking about some upcoming changes. As we begin to move forward, we've seen the numbers, the numbers are tracking in the right direction uh, and we are reopening our community. And so we wanted to share this morning our next steps and I'm gonna turn it over to Ricky and Phil. Good morning, Ricky Vaca, Food and Beverage Director here at Regency Oaks. We have some very exciting news today. The uh, new dining schedule effective Tuesday, August 25th will be coming out. On these, these flyers will be in your mailbox on Monday and it's gonna go like this. We'll start off with the tavern. You will still be receiving your breakfast the same, a grab and go from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Lunch will be discontinued. Dinner is now gonna be a grab and go, similar to what you were getting at lunchtime when you were going through the tavern. The dining rooms will be opening. Yay! Limited seating capacity to 25%. The same menu for delivery and in the dining rooms north and south. Circle on the weekly menu if you want to eat in the dining room or you want a delivery to your room. Home, de home delivery has been changed to start at 315. Lunch is available only in the North Dining Room to all residents, just as like, like in the past. If you circle Dining Room for lunch, Dining Services staff member will call you. You choose a spe specific time for your reservation Lunch dining hours are from noon to two. If you circle dining room for dinner, a dining service staff member will call you to choose the time for your reservation. Dining room hours are from four to six. No more than four to a table, please. Help with social distancing near the host desk. Arrive as close as possible to your reservation time. Please check current dress code poster in the mail room, dining room, and front desk. Thank you for this exciting news. All right, well that's uh, really exciting news and I know our residents must be looking forward to getting back into the dining rooms and returning to uh, some sort of normalcy. I know I'm sick and tired of eating off styrofoam plates and uh, the chance to go back and have a, a meal prepared and served on China sounds pretty exciting to me. So look for more information next week. We'll continue to roll out the specifics and share the details. Uh, I'll be addressing it at Tuesday Talk. Look for the flyer in uh, your mailbox early part of the week. And uh, we're, we're really excited to be moving forward. We're gonna go now to uh, questions and I'll roll it back to uh, Don Infante for our first question. Okay, well, let's have some questions now on my first question. Question: I want to have some dialogue here with Brant on the on the liability letter. As things open up, as we get out, we get out more into the community and stuff. It's going to be it's going to be tough, uh, and, and it's going to be good for us, but it's going to be tough. So this liability letter is a thing of unity, okay, for us as a community showing where we are with regard to pulling together on the coronavirus effort. And so I want to ask Brad, Brad, is there some additional stimulation we could do? What is it we should be doing to try to encourage our, our residents? I know you've made a push on it and I'm sort of scratching with you because because we're a team, what can we do to get our residents out and get the letters in? 
Okay, a great question, Don, and happy to address it. When we think about this liability uh, uh, waiver, it actually does two things. There is a release form that releases Regency Oaks from, from uh, liability, and then there is the risk acknowledgement section of the waiver. I'll talk about the uh, first section, which is the liability waiver. By signing that, you are not releasing uh, Regency Oaks from gross negligence. Uh, anytime there is an instant of gross negligence, a liability waiver is not going to provide any protection whatsoever. What it does do is provide protection from ordinary uh, liability. And that's what you might reasonably expect to incur, a reasonable person would reasonably expect as we reopen America, the risk is going to go up and your risk is no longer ordinary. And that's why that has legal bearing. You're not signing away your gross negligence, uh, the opportunity to recover, it's the ordinary. The second thing is the um, more important portion for me, and that's the acknowledgement of the increased risk. And this is what I'm looking for, for my residents to partner with me and understand that we're interested in moving forward. We want to get back out into life. We want to open up transportation, bring housekeeping uh, into your apartments, open up the side doors, return to a, a normal dining situation. We are leaving the castle and moat defense uh, where we haven't let anyone in and we haven't let you out. And so as we change our behavior and start to experience higher risk activities, group eating, group activities, group transportation, your risk is going to increase. What I'm asking for is an acknowledgement that you understand that risk is going to increase and that you're going to be a participant in helping keep all of us safe that you're gonna wear a mask, that you're gonna practice good social distancing, that if you're ill, you're gonna stay in your apartment, that if you're showing symptoms, you're going to report it to Leslie early, that you're going to submit to a temperature check upon uh, leaving and re-entering the community, that you're going to do that on a daily basis, that you're going to allow a wellness nurse to come into your apartment uh, if you are showing symptoms. And so that's why this is important to me, is it, no, it lets me know that the residents are with me on this. As we open up the community, we take on a higher risk profile, you're acknowledging that you have a role to play and that you're going to do your part in making sure that Regency Oaks is safe and that your neighbors are gonna be safe as well. My question is, how many people are actually having their temperature taken at the front desk every day? For residents that are currently taking their temperature, the South has about 100 residents that are checking each day. In the North, we have just about 60, maybe 70 on a good day. So our South building for residents is doing a fantastic job. North, I would like to see some more temperatures being taken by residents. For our employees, remember, they check in every day. And in some instances, we have them check twice daily. Thank you. Judy Studebaker, and I have a question for Ricky. Uh, is there a limit to the number of days that we can sign up for dining room? To answer your question, you can come to the dining room every day if you'd like, and also um, there is no meal pro program currently right now. You can come to the dining room, you can go get your breakfast in the tavern. Thank you. Thank you all for your, for your input, and uh, thank you all for, for viewing. Uh, I'd just like to make one final pitch to you all, please. Get that liability form in, please. Just. Take a minute, sign it, get it in. It's a sign of community unity at a time when we're trying to move forward and open up our dining rooms and get our transportation flowing well again. So please, please, just take a second. Read the form, it's a liability form. 
sign it and get it into the front desk. And I thank you for your cooperation. Have a great weekend.